Hello. As you've just heard, my name's Alex, and I'm the president of the Australian Medical Students Association. I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, who are the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal Nation, past, present, and emerging. Thank you to the AMA for the opportunity not only to speak to you today, but for your ongoing support for both AMSA and all of the Australian medical students. On my first day of medical school, we were asked to look on either side of us. It was a fun guessing game. Which one of us three would develop a mental illness over the course of our degree? A few months later, I first became involved in AMSA because as a student starting to see the broken parts of our system, it seemed to be where stuff got done. Doctors, and by extension, medical students, hold a trusted place in society. And I saw AMSA bring us together so that we could wield that collective political capital to achieve real outcomes. Realising that student voices actually mattered in the conversation, and that through groups like AMSA and the AMA, I could influence real change on the systems I was working in was incredibly empowering. It was also daunting, because we have a lot to work on. Where our organisations speak out, people listen. Students will remember the AMA joining us in the fight for marriage equality for a long time to come. It was a powerful signal to the Australian community that the AMA and Australian doctors supported our queer patients and our queer peers at a time when many were hurting. It mattered. The Australian community will remember Australian doctors and the AMA speaking out on the health of the refugees on Nauru and Manus. It mattered. That is quite the responsibility. In this room, you are the people who will continue to set the AMA's messages and vision moving forward. Often that will be on matters that affect the health of all Australians. But for today, I'd like you to look inwards, a little bit closer to home, at medical culture. I'm often told that when it comes to changing culture, students are at the front. <laughs> students are the way forward. This year, I sat in countless meetings where reassurances have been given that our problems will be solved because medical students will re eventually reach the top and we have the mindset to create the change. Medical students of Australia are extraordinary, but that's a huge burden to put on our shoulders alone without the structures to support us. We have the least power and often the most to lose. Generational change is a myth. When the problems lie in a system that the upcoming generations are still trained to conform to, they will continue to perpetrate that culture unless it is actively disrupted. We need support from you, doctors who have power in the system to help us change it. I've been lucky enough to spend this year listening to students and hearing their stories. I'm here representing an exceptional group with diverse backgrounds and experiences. Medical school has never been without its difficulties. While some may have shifted for the better since your time in training, in other ways we face new challenges and old challenges we hoped would have disappeared. Challenges in gender equity, in diversity and leadership, in mental health and mistreatment in medical education, and in the growing training pressures that we'll face on graduation. To begin, gender equity is alive and well in medicine. It covers a spectrum of sexist behavior from well-meaning but gendered comments to clearly abhorrent harassment and assault. You heard yesterday about the very real barriers women in medicine face on a daily basis. The invasive interview questions the pregnancy discrimination, the pay gap. This all starts in medical school. Every female student will be able to recall a time they were told they should pick a family-friendly specialty. I've spoken to students who were told there was no point teaching them to suture because they were just going to become a GP anyway. To a student who was well known to either flirt or bully with their female students and told she was lucky when she was chosen for the flirting. It's what we call unconscious bias. Women and men alike, not meaning to, doubt women's abilities just that much more. Women need to work harder to prove themselves because they don't fit into the leadership image that we all expect to see, whether it's in the operating theatre or in the hospital boardroom. It's not really about gender or sex, 
It's about power and authority and who we see holding it. Women are underrepresented in nearly every single position of medical leadership. They're far less likely to be medical school deans, far less likely to be chief executives of hospitals, receive research grants, and be AMA presidents. They are less quickly promoted and less paid. The truth is, most doctors involved in low-level sexual harassment and sexism aren't malicious. They think they're being helpful, being flattery, telling a funny joke. Many never actually receive feedback that their behavior is inappropriate. So, the behavior builds, and the lack of accountability builds. And those with bad intentions, the opportunities to abuse their power also builds. As we tolerate less confronting comments, we pave the way for them to escalate unchecked. Everyday sexism looks benign, but it shaped the medical, what medicine looks like today, from our first year university students to all the people sitting in this room. In the past couple of years, medicine in Australia has been rocked by revelations of endemic harassment. I don't think anyone here will be truly surprised when the next horrible event breaks. We haven't changed enough to expect them to stop. But it's not enough to wait to be shocked back into action. There's no more room for empathy, for apathy in this space. And the same goes for all vulnerable population groups. There are exceptional Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander medical students. But compared to other students, the barriers to graduating build up. Earlier this year, I was able to speak to the student representatives of the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, AIDA, and hear their stories of daily stereotyping and racist comments, of being regularly told they had taken the place of someone who actually deserved to be in medicine. A survey by AIDA found that nearly 50% of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander doctors face bullying, racism or violence a few times a month or even daily. While more and more the makeup of our medical students is reflective of our diverse communities, this isn't reaching the tiers of leadership where the ability to really create change lies. The hurdles of being leaders and advocates only escalate when certain groups are excluded and less valued and protected in the medical sphere. For students and doctors in training, the health industry is hierarchical and rigid. Challenging norms simply isn't safe territory. We know that most students mistreated during medical education don't report it. That's for two reasons. They don't know how, and they're afraid of what might happen if they do. When asked to elaborate, here are their responses. We are taught from our first year that whistleblowing in medicine is career suicide. My supervisor could be my examiner. I tried. The university told me it was the hospital's responsibility. The hospital directed me back to the university. It doesn't look good for getting into a specialty program. Even as someone who has spent this year speaking out on this issue, when I go back into clinical rotations next year, I can't be confident that I would report it if bullying or harassment happened to me. I, like so many students are, am worried about what might happen on the wards but I'm even more worried about what might happen with a report. Which means that the responsibility to speak lies with you. To take colleagues aside if they start crossing lines. To create systems in hospital where reporting and, um, doesn't put students and staff at risk. To demand tangible consequences. Because we can change the structures which drive medical culture. We only need to look to mental health to see this community rally and say, enough is enough. The promises from COAG to change mandatory reporting laws, to remove barriers for health professionals, to seek appropriate treatment for mental health, a proof of that. That came from sustained and powerful advocacy from medical students and from the AMA. Now, the work is far from done, but for a start, I'm hoping that I can look forward to not hearing any more students told that seeing a GP will end their career. It won't solve all the culprits behind poor student mental health. As students, we're staring down the barrel of the growing pressure of vocational training. There are more of us graduating than there are specialty training positions, 
and by the time it comes for us to apply, it'll have reached crisis point. Knowing that is our future, it should come as no surprise that students are doing everything we can to get ahead. Research projects in the holidays, masters in parallel with full-time medical study, part-time work. And we can talk about work-life balance as much as we'd like, but as long as that's the status quo, mental health is always going to suffer. Once we reach the workforce, many of us will take years of clinical practice for PhDs or other pieces of paper which make us better candidates, but not necessarily better doctors. We'll follow the signals that the colleges and the profession send us. For a focus on clinical education and service, like so many of you here said was the priority yesterday, they need to be recognised accordingly. Now, when it comes to mental health, there's one area where students and senior doctors still don't seem to always see eye to eye. Resilience. For us, resilience has become a dirty word. It's not that we don't believe in prioritising mental wellness. It's a word that's been overused and at the worst possible times. Resilience is a suicidal friend being directed to mindfulness courses. Resilience takes students to the darkest point and tells them that they should have been stronger. It acknowledges that the medical training environment is flawed, but at the same time says the answer is fixing the students rather than larger change. That's what students hear. So, instead, let's talk about what they're supposed to be resilient against. 60% of medical students have witnessed or experienced mistreatment in medical education. That's two in every three. Most of the time, this comes in the form of belittlement, condescension, or humiliation. Women are more likely to be mis mistreated in medical education than men, queer students more than heterosexual, clinical students more than preclinical. Consultants are the primary offenders in half of the cases. In the medical world, we're expected to teach and lead as a core part of our work. Doctors spend years learning to practice medicine, but are expected to teach with no training at all. Your actions matter for the student standing in front of you at that moment, but also for how you role model their training and teaching going forward. We replicate the examples that we're shown in our training. So the way you teach now will influence what the medical profession looks like in 20 years. If you want to see things change, that's the place to start. As a teacher, role model safe practice, good communication, work-life balance. A positive culture is a safe culture. I know that's not always easy. As students, we take time away from your busy days. Sometimes we don't know how to help, or we know that the gaps in our knowledge fall short of your expectations. All students know the feeling of being a burden on their teams. But to learn, we need to be in the room and be able to ask those questions. Medical students want to work hard and be good, safe doctors. You hold the power to impact the lives of your students each and every day. That's not to say they need to be your first priority, Patients should always come first. But it doesn't need to be one or the other. It only takes a moment to say good job or to answer a question or explain how to improve next time. That moment can make your students' day. It can keep their love for medicine going through all the other parts of this profession which may otherwise leave us disillusioned far too soon. Thank you to all of you here who make that effort to be positive mentors and teachers. You are appreciated. I believe we can build a medical culture that is safe and nurturing. But it can't wait 20 years till my peers are filling these seats. In the way you teach, in the way you lead, and in the systems you influence, be part of that change. And I promise you, we will do you proud.